American armored cars, three of which you see here at the Museum of American Armor here on Long Island. We have an early M8 light armored car, a late M8 armored car, and an M20 utility vehicle. Uh, my friend Chris, who is actually a very knowledgeable uh, tank and other vehicle historian, is going to join me here in a minute and we're going to tell you a little bit about the history of use of armored cars by the military in World War II. Um, as well as show you a little bit of like the um, details of these particular vehicles. All right, so this is Chris, uh, my good friend who is a fellow tank and armor aficionado. He is going to give you a little bit of a rundown on the M8 armored car. Take it away. All right, so um, the M8 was designed in 1941 by the Ford Motor Company. Um, it was originally designed to fill a tank destroyer role. It was originally designed for specifically for tank destroyer purposes. Um, it ended up obviously not really being seen, uh, you know, seeing use in that role, I should say. Um, it saw a lot of success as a scouting vehicle due to the, uh, the open top nature. There is no roof. Um, so you have very good visibility, easy visibility. Um, so it has a 37 millimeter M6 uh, cannon. Uh, with a coaxial Browning M1919. This gun, uh, you know, by mid to late war, not the best anti-tank gun out there anymore. Not going to be able to deal with the heavier armor that the US is starting to come up against. But for the scouting role, you know, I'll take a 37 uh, millimeter M6 over nothing. So originally tank destroyer, sees much more success as a scouting vehicle, which it is good at. Um, you know, it's a six by six, so that means that all of the wheels are being driven, you know, every single wheel can have power going to it. If you want to get in closer here, you know, we can look at, at the suspension. We have, uh, you know, we have leaf spring suspension back here. You can see it's one leaf that connects to uh, either of the wheels. Um, you know, standard, standard uh, automotive kind of stuff. Um, you know, we have a... At the front, we also have leaf spring suspension, but at a different, it's a different type of usage. You'll see this on cars as well. Um, you know, you have the, the actual wheel is sitting on the leaf as opposed to the ends of the leaf touching the wheels. Um, but yeah, so you have that six by six capability. Um, you still have pretty light armor, but uh, again, can't emphasize enough, a very good scouting vehicle and decent firepower for, for what you get in this package. Um, moving on to some other automotive components, we have the uh, inline six back here. Right now we're doing a little bit of work on this one. Um, what are you doing here, Chris? We uh, noticed that there's a little bit of an oil leak and we tightened down that oil filter housing and we're hoping that'll stop the leak, but we're gonna see what happens. Um, so yeah, you got that, the Hercules uh, JXD inline six. It makes 110 horsepower, uh, you know, we're talking about 1940s technology, nothing crazy, but you know, it gets this thing moving. Um, it could reach up to 55 miles an hour, top speed, flat out. Yep. Not sure if anybody actually reached that, it may be in the theater, but yeah. that's the hard fact. M8, an RM20. But yeah, these are these are designed to be fast and mobile, um, not really designed for fighting enemy tanks and things like that. Yep. Um, even though, like you said, it was designed as a, as a tank destroyer originally, ironically. Yep. yep. And there's that um, in, in the tank destroyer vein. I just remembered. You probably know the famous story of the uh, the King Tiger that was taken out by the M8. Yes. Um, there's been a lot of research into that, and from what I've heard, we know an M8 killed something that was big in German, but likely not a King Tiger. Um, 
there there's not really much uh there's not a whole lot of german uh you know reports out there in the first place there's not a whole lot of like documentation yeah, whereas whole... we can go to national archives and pull you know unit reports yep, yep. um morning reports um all that kind of stuff you yep, know yep yeah we uh from what we do have from the german side and the american side uh it it was more likely you know it might have been a panzer IV. It might have been, you know, I think the original document didn't even say that it was specifically by name a Tiger II. Right. It could have been, who knows, it could have been just a regular and, Tiger. And frankly, know? in a lot of period documentation, uh, especially in U.S., um, like documents and things like that, GIs generally, whether it's GIs or like the uh, clerks and stuff that like would write the reports, they would often misrepresent or maybe intentionally or unintentionally they would call a, like almost every german tank tiger. a tiger or it's something tiger. like yep, that even tiger. though the tiger really was not all that commonly seen mm -hmm. overseas um, by american troops uh, in the armored divisions tank battalions tank yep. battalions yep. that kind of stuff um so yeah you know i just wanted to point that out because even though you know the point it might not be as fantastical as a king tiger was destroyed by this little armored car the point still stands. This armored car was hiding. Some sort of large German vehicle passed it, and it used its superior visibility and superior speed to knock out a German armored fighting vehicle of some sort. And that's kind of, I think that kind of encapsulates what this vehicle is about. Yeah. It's got speed, it's got just enough armor to protect you against maybe even some heavy machine gun fire. Um, but it's really supposed to be scouting, you know, taking out something in a pinch with that 37 millimeter gun if you really need to. You know, you you know, it's not always about armor on armor too. You know, you got you got canister shot, small yep. high explosive rounds. You know, there's there's it's a versatile vehicle, and uh, you know, for America, it got the job done. Yep. Here we are in the driver and co-driver compartments. Uh, tell us what we're looking at. All right, so uh, yeah, you know, you got your standard fare, uh, you know, automotive gauges you'd see on, you know, any car of the period, really, or any sort of, uh, you know, armored vehicle. Um, you know, not much to go into there that, that you know, isn't self-explanatory. What are you holding there? Uh, this is the uh, shift lever. Uh, it's a four-speed transmission, so that, uh, you know, four-speed manual. So you got your clutch, your brake pedal, your gas pedal over here, just your gas, brake, clutch. Um, I actually just discovered this. I didn't realize that the shift pattern is backwards from most vehicles. The first gear is all the way over to the right and forwards. Yep. And then you go second, and then you know you gotta get over third and fourth through this gated transmission. Um, but yeah, uh, pretty basic stuff to see here. You know, uh, it's 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 an armored tub that is a car. It literally is an armored tub. Um, and right here is actually a little interesting. If you're wondering what this hump is. This is actually where the uh, the differential for the front the front axle is. So that's why there's this hump here because it's got to fit a you know driving gears for the differential. Yep. Um, the driver is doing the driving. The co-driver, Adam. The co-driver is basically navigating, yep. um, spotting. Um, these these armored cars they don't have like a bow machine gun like a yep. Sherman tank or a Stuart tank would. Um, so your role in that position is a little bit different. All right, so here we are up in top of the turret of the M8. We have an M250 caliber machine gun for the commander or gunner, whoever is more capable of handling it at the time. Um, you can rotate it all the way around the turret on this track. So either guy can really use it or even somebody on the back if you have riders. Um, so Chris, you are in the gunner's seat. Yep. Tell us what he would be doing. So um, as the gunner, uh, you know, here's a 37 millimeter here, sends the breach. Um, we have access to a lot of ammo. There's ammo storage down here, but we have ammo over here with the commander and ammo behind us. You know, you grab these 37 millimeter rounds out and you'd have to do your job with them. Yeah, you these know, racks go all the way around the turret pretty much. Yep. Um, you can see them, but they're not filled right now. We do a few dummy rounds in there. Yep. And then there's additional storage down on the floor by your feet. There's compartments you can open up with uh, more ammo, smoke grenades, signal flags. You can even see like some of them marked uh, rations, that kind of stuff. There's a radio right there. Yep. Um, every one of these M8s would have a radio of some kind, and that is actually what powers your entire intercom system in this vehicle. Uh, this M8 does not have its uh, interphone boxes. 
Um, it only has the radio itself, but each position in this vehicle, gunner, commander, driver, and uh, co-driver, they would all have uh, the intercom box that you plug your headset and your comms gear into so you can talk to the rest of your crew, or the commander can talk to other vehicles. Um, this, this gun actually is not a live gun. This is a gas gun. Basically, uh, propane and oxygen are used to simulate uh, gunfire with uh, this gun. Uh, that's why you see the, the, the colored wires all the way around here. Uh, not period correct, obviously. However, it works as intentioned for what we do. Um, it's a lot easier to use and take care of than a actual live breach and a lot less complicated as far as legality, that kind of stuff. Um, there you have the coaxial uh, 1919 30-06. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll talk about the uh, you know the traverse and the elevation methods. You know, um, nothing here is powered. This is not like most tanks. You know, by by mid to late war, where um, you you know you have some sort of hydraulics uh, moving your turret around for you. You got to do it on your own. But it's not that bad. It's actually pretty easy to move. I'd say all you got to do is turn this to go, uh, you know, left and right. It takes traverse. relatively little force on that. Oh yeah, it's really easy to move it. Yeah, it might take a minute, but you'll get where you got to go just yep. by hand. Um, and your elevation is also. It's also manual. There's a crank manual. down there. Yep, yep. You got your wheel here. Um, sights, gunner sights. Uh, you can see that tube goes right out the mantlet. Um, in case you're wondering, I know I'm a little tall. These seats are adjustable. They go yep, up and down. They do. Um, Every, pretty much every seat in the tank or tank destroyer armored car is adjustable. However, the front seats in the M8 and M20, that you can't really go up or down. You just kind of have to like there's shrink, a, shrink, shrink yourself and like push yourself further down towards like the front of the vehicle to get lower, essentially. Yep, yep. And also, um, like a lot of smaller vehicles from earlier in the war, there's no turret basket. Yep. Uh, there's a partial kind of basket they give you a little footrest uh, some of them uh, I believe the other armored car we have has another footrest for your actual foot yep. but uh, you know it is something you have to be aware of when you're the crew that you're turning this vehicle you might get your foot caught in something if you you're not paying attention. You can get your foot attention. caught, you can get your arm caught, you can get your gear caught, you can get a, a you know, rifle caught even yep. though there are there are racks for M1 carbines for every crewman in this vehicle because M8 crewmen and M20 crewmen were armed with uh, the 30 carbine uh, M1 carbine from World War II, and rather than giving them pistols or uh, like a Thompson some machine or something like that, uh, everybody in this vehicle will be armed with the M1 carbine. So hence you can see the little little uh, slit little holes down there for the M1 carbine, and it just kind of snaps in place there. Yep. Um, so that's your personal defense weapons in case your vehicle is knocked out. Wait, hold on, let's take a picture. So what's nice about our museum here on Long Island is we actually have both an early variant of the M8 as well as a late variant. And there's a few subtle differences between them that, um, that are notable that you can tell whether it's an early production vehicle or a late production. Early production M8s had mine racks on the side of them right here. You put three uh, mines in there, anti-tank mines. Also, early M8s did not come with a ring for your 50 cal up on the turret. The earliest of ones had a post at the back of the turret with a 50 cal on it. And that was not very conducive for the gunner or commander to man that machine gun while they were in action. Because essentially your 50 cal is facing forward and your gun, your, the, hand, the, like the handle with your trigger is back here behind you. So that's damn near impossible for you to shoot forward with your 50 cal when your trigger is way, way back here outside the vehicle. You could shoot behind you, of course, but if your target is in front of you, that's a little bit more complicated. Another difference between the early and late M8s is the late M8 had this storage box added to the front of it. As you can see, this early M8 does not have it on the front. Side skirts, there's a ton of variant uh, variations and what's on and what's off of M8s during World War II. Generally speaking, most M8s you see in original footage are going to have their skirts removed because it's much easier to clean and repair things on the vehicle when you can actually access you know, your springs and your shocks and suspension and all this kind of stuff, not having to 
pretty much remove or flip up your entire side skirts to access certain things. This is also a very common look for an M8 World War II, having just the front fender but no back fenders. You do see back fenders and no front fender. You see no fenders. You see all the fenders. But generally speaking, no fenders will be most common, and just the front fender is also very common as well. Um, all the fenders is pretty common as well. It really varies and depends on what unit and time frame, like with anything in World War II reenacting or vehicle collecting. So now you can see the late M8, and in place of the mine racks on the early vehicle, you will have the storage bins, which actually do create a lot more space and are more helpful to you. Storing gear, tools, things like that rather than just having three mines strapped to the side of the vehicle. As you can see, these vehicles have additional gear added to them on the outside because during a war, you actually need a lot more gear than you might even be issued. And a lot of uh, soldiers in World War II on American tanks, tank destroyers, armored cars, half tracks, things like that, they would add additional items to the outside of their vehicles or extra tonnage, extra bedrolls, extra blankets, extra shelter halves for better sleeping quarters, things like that. Um, shelter halves for covering things, keeping things dry. Um, you have a signal panel here. A lot of times those would be put on the back of these to signal to aircraft that there is a friendly vehicle uh, below them, things like that. You have a tent fly right here. Guys can sleep underneath that at night. You have another bedroll right here with a sleeping bag in it, some captured wine. Not actually wine in there, it's just a, just a bottle. These that bags with extra rations, gear. This is a piece of canvas to cover things. Uh, folding shovel and your standard Pioneer tools as well on every vehicle. Lightweight gas mask bags, same things that riflemen would carry. Every single person in an M8 or a tank destroyer, tank, things like that, they would all have their own M1 helmet. As per normal for every GI in World War II, you would be issued an M1 helmet to yourself from the Army, whereas tanker helmets would be issued per vehicle. That's the difference between two uh, helmets. You have your own M1 helmet, the vehicle has your tanker helmet, as well as your comms gear that is issued to your vehicle. So if you don't have a tanker helmet in your vehicle that fits your head, you're gonna have to trade with somebody else who might have a bigger size. Which every vehicle would have one of each common size. So if you have two big headed guys that are like seven and a half in the same vehicle, you would probably have to swap with somebody else in another vehicle who has a tanker helmet that's too big for them. And now we've come to the last vehicle on our road right here. This is the M20 utility car. We're going to bring Chris back in and we're going to talk a little bit about that. And then we're going to wrap up. Well, if you compare it to the M8 uh, that we just looked at, it's pretty much the same, except for one big difference. Uh, it has no turret. And instead of the turret, we just have that ring mount for the 50 cal. Um, this, uh, you know, it's... Uh, would you agree with me, Adam? I guess this is more of, of a command variant. This is, this is more of a command vehicle, basically like your platoon leader or a company commander, things like that would be in, whereas the M8 is more of a infantry support kind of vehicle to take out bunkers, take out small vehicles, yep. that kind of thing. Um, the M20 is still a useful vehicle, but it's, it's more not, supplemental. It's more supplemental and it's more for like a command role. Gotcha. Maybe not maybe not as much of a command role as like a command car or something like that to haul around. Yep. yep. Officers, things like that. Mm -hmm. However, it is more geared more towards that than an M8.
And one final point to make on all these, I know we said they're relatively light armored. Um, I mean, it's literally called an M8 light armored car. Um, just if you want a number value for those, we're looking at anywhere from nine and a half to 25 millimeters. Um, so that's one inch. 25 millimeters is just about one inch. One inch of armor, uh, and that pretty no. much that'll pretty much only stop small arms fire, such as machine yeah. guns, rifles, things like yeah. that. It is sloped. Um, now, don't, don't get me wrong. That armor is sloped, but you know, uh, you know, maybe you have a chance of stopping some heavy machine gun fire, but you know, I wouldn't count on it. I wouldn't. Yeah. I wouldn't Even yeah. armor piercing from like a 50 cal or yeah. an MG42 might actually be able to get through. Yeah, yeah it's possible you get hit in the right spot. Um, but we are not. You know we're not this is not a we problem. know we know guns pretty well but we are not like ballistics experts yeah, yeah. so we can't really tell you what type of armor like x bullet would go yes, through you yes. know but yeah so. just just make note it's lightly armored it's sloped still lightly armored again not made to take a frontline hit made it originally be a tank destroyer you know to be maneuverable uh just enough armor to get you out of trouble if you're running some infantry maybe you know something like that all right, so that is the M8 light armored car and the M20 utility car we have here at the Museum of American Armor on Long Island. I hope you guys enjoyed this video, and thank you very much to my friend Chris, as well as my friends in the Museum of American Armor that I volunteer with as well, for helping me put this video together. Um, if you guys like this video and you learned something, please leave a like down below and subscribe. If you want to see more videos on World War II era armored vehicles, um, please leave a comment and let me know below and let me, let me know what kind of vehicles you want to see. Uh, we don't have every vehicle from, from World War II here, but we do have a lot of interesting pieces. And they move. Pretty much everything in our museum here does, does move. So, all right. Thank you guys again for watching and please subscribe, please leave do. a comment, uh, leave a like. So, thank you very much and have a good one.